uh, he will, um, we will have uh, Yaku speak, then we'll have Ashwell, and then we'll have Anastasia, okay? But uh, we're recording now, so welcome to the uh, second um, um, postgraduate symposium. As we've mentioned before in previous emails, the, the, the main goal of this is to foster an academic community, um, a community where we uh, can share our research, uh, get some critical feedback, learn what other people are doing. And if someone's doing something that's similar to what you're doing, maybe you should contact them and email them and uh, uh, share your research, share your notes, uh, maybe even co-author a paper together. You never know. You know, you got to think about that. You're, you guys are academics now. So publication is not out of the realm of impossibility, even if you're not going to go into the so-called academic track. So, uh, you know, that's the main goal here is to foster a community and get that critical feedback. So uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions, um, um, critical questions, questions for clarification, anything like that to the uh, presenters. Just be a little respectful, be a little kind, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a great discussion and uh, we'll move on. And uh, greetings, Leanne, and greetings, uh, um, Ntuli. Uh, thank you both for coming. Um, at the moment, I'm going to hand it over to Jakub Kruger. You should know him, Dr. Kruger. He's our, our uh, head of department of philosophy. Um, at the moment, I don't have the title of his paper uh, or his presentation. He can give it to you in a second. But I do know that he is also going to be speaking about some of the um, um, trajectories that we have and some exciting developments we'll be having in the philosophy department as well. So, Yaku, it's up to you. Um, please, you have the floor. Thanks, Justin. Um, good evening, everyone. And it's really um, great to be here with you. Uh, thanks for organizing every, everything, Justin. And um, yeah, and I'm also super excited that so many people did actually manage to join in the midst of uh, all the load shedding and all the challenges. So, uh, thanks for all of that. Uh, okay, I want to um share my screen that is enabled so there's the screen and um can someone just unmute and, and tell me if you are able to see the screen um if if, uh, if the sharing is working it's working. yes it's working well okay thank you terry and justin um so what i want to present to you is um really some thoughts this is not a well worked out paper or anything um and it's it's kind of general in some senses it's it's so a, a general idea that i want to present to you um of you know what i i am excited about working on at the moment and also where i see some opportunities for the department of philosophy to uh, become involved in, or perhaps to focus on it somehow in the in the future. Um, so uh, this, at the moment, Saint Augustine is 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 so small. Hey, um, it's it's not going to be exclusive. So if people want to work in the Department of Philosophy in other fields, of course that's also fine. But uh, just trying to share with you, you know, where my own thinking is going and how I see possibilities for for our department of philosophy perhaps to work and um, also to search for um, contributions that we can make here specifically in the South African context, even though uh, what I am saying this evening is, is fairly general and it's not particularly only from a South African context. Um, and I'd like to hear your opinions on that as well. Right. So the, the, the topic, the title of, of uh, what I want to talk to you about this evening is learning to dwell uh philosophy as oikology and i'll hope to explain all of those terms uh, a little bit later more but um this this title comes from a it's a quote from martin heidegger it, it's it's taken from a quote by martin heidegger uh, in that um i think it was a lecture uh, building dwelling thinking and he says that the real dwelling plight lies in this, that mortals ever search anew for the nature of dwelling, that they must ever learn to dwell. So as human beings, we must always again learn to dwell. Um, and what, what does that mean? Hey, and so it's a kind of a project somehow uh, to think of what philosophy might mean. 
along those lines. So my central proposal um, is that there exists a kind of a, 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 a fittingness. Maybe one can even put it stronger. It's an affinity between philosophy and ecology uh, that can bring us to think of these two disciplines uh, as very much related, interrelated, um, and uh, somehow together, even as flip sides of each other. Um, I think in some respect, we, it, it, it might even be possible to, to think of philosophy as ecology and ecology as philosophy. All right. And, and so you can hear this is very broad. Hey, uh, so this is so broad, you can fly a Boeing through, through this thesis. But uh, it can, I think, um, be explicated or whatever. If you, if you now make a specific uh, paper, journal entry or whatever, you can, um, there's, there's room for focus in this. So what I want to do in, in trying to explain this, um, that philosophy somehow and ecology have to do with each other and that we, we in a way, we need to understand ecology or think of ecology when we want to understand philosophy and we we need to think of philosophy when we understand ecology in unpacking this i'm going to look at some developments from around about the 17th century um in in western thought primarily um, more or less from the 17th century onwards now the seven in the 17th century in europe um of course, the term ecology was not yet coined. And we'll get to that just now. But I do think that the developments that happened somehow or already has some relevance on that, even though the word, the term ecology was not yet um, coined in the 17th century in Europe. What I want to do is I want to, to talk to you about um, a bifurcation that happened in the way people thought, the way people approached nature, that somehow happened there around about the beginning of the modern epoch in, in Western thought, in, in, in European thought. So a bifurcation, the word bifurcation means splitting into two. Hey, It's a fork, forking into two. Um, and I'll say something more about that. But this bifurcation that happened there around about the beginning of modern philosophy in Europe resulted in philosophy and ecology somehow being thought of as opposites to each other. Um, philosophy, if philosophy is about thought and ecology is about nature, then thought and nature somehow came to be seen as opposites to each other. But um, at the same time, some are also flip sides of each other. And uh, the, 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 the fate of philosophy mirrored that of ecology. The, the fate of ecology mirrored that of philosophy. So I want to just look at that in a little bit. But, but the point is that this bifurcation of, of nature that happened in, at the beginning of modern, modern times is wasn't a good thing, right? This is a kind of a a, a wrong turn off. Uh, so, so every good talk must bring in some drama and intrigue, hey. And so I think this was a kind of a, a wrong turn that was taken. Uh, this bifurcation of nature that happened, and in in trying to address this, trying to remedy or heal this wrong turn, I am going to point to this. The images of dwelling, building. And so a dwelling is um, a dwelling is where people dwell. Hey, a dwelling. That's that's a kind of a not so common word, but I, I suppose if you are married to an architect like I am, then the word dwelling, a DWG plan, <laughs> is not so so strange. Uh, so dwelling means building to come uh, to be at home to come home right i'm going to reach for those 
metaphors in order to try and suggest a way of overcoming this bifurcation um, and a way of thinking philosophy and ecology together. Um, so uh, philosophy is a form of ecology and ecology on the other hand is a way of living with wisdom. And what is philosophy otherwise than the love of wisdom? So, so I think these two are, you know, close together. When I speak of ecology here, I'm not first and foremost talking about the, the science of ecology. Um, ever since the middle of the, the 20th century, ecology has developed into, you know, a, a, a whole academic field. I suppose at many universities, you can, can pursue a qualification e ecological studies, and it sort of tried to move itself into the direction of the natural sciences, right? So ecology, together with life sciences, going into the biological sphere, trying very, very hard to be hard nosed science. Hey, and of course, this is the this is the it's one of the elements at play in the whole thing is that natural science is such an incredibly strong cultural force in our world. So ecology, since the middle of the 20th century, tried very hard to pose as a hard nosed natural science. There are other elements in there, of course. Um, uh, I mean, social uh, ecology, developmental ecology, all of that, they are there. But the question always remains, you know, what, sh how should we think of ecology? Is it, a, is it a natural science? Is it a social science? Or is it something altogether, altogether different? Okay, I'm not going to, to speak about that. I'm not going to speak about the philosophy of science, of ecology. I'm rather going to speak about the philosophical presuppositions. Let's let's name it that. You know what what philosophical questions or choices um, do we have to make when we think of ecology? Um, and so this is where I think. Uh, philosophers can make a contribution. I don't want to discredit all the, the scientific work that is being done in ecology at all, but I think philosophers can and should make a, you know, make make points about all of this. Um, so um, also to to the extent that you know what should ecology be? Um, many. Many uh, philosophers have pointed out that there isn't a clear-cut philosophy of ecology. Um, it, it somehow is a kind of a middle position subject. Uh, where does it fit in? Is it, as I mentioned, is it a natural science? Is it, a, is it really ethics? Is it environmental ethics? Or what should it be? So this is where I want to make a, a, a contribution. And in suggesting that philosophy and ecology uh, has to do with building and dwelling and homecoming, I reach now for the Greek word oikos. So the Greek word oikos actually means house or household or dwelling place or habitation. Um, and of course, as you can see there, hey, um, it was the that Greek word that the German zoologist Ernst Haeckel used in 1873 to coin this this phrase or this expression of ecology. Um, he, he in German he called it ecology, but that's just the German form uh, which of which we today have ecology. So the word oikos. Um, home, dwelling place, homestead, is really the the root, the etymological root of the word echo. And I wonder how many people today are really aware of this. That uh, that this is the thing. And I'm I'm going to suggest that perhaps if we really take a Heidegger's point at heart, in other words, that philosophy or the, the challenge for human thought is always to learn again how to dwell, how to really 
dwell, um, to be at home somehow. And then there's a very interesting areas that open up in the discussion about what ecology is, but also then what philosophy is. So you uh, you hear that when I now say we, we, we talk about philosophy as or ecology, there, uh, there's this reference to Martin Heidegger. Um, and I definitely think that uh, he's going to be an important uh, conversation partner, I suppose, in this whole discussion. There is also um, the, the, the call by Pope Francis um, in uh, his encyclical Laudato Si to care for our common home. Hey, so there's, there's definitely another line of uh, influence, so to speak, or of um, attraction that I think necessitates us to, sp to speak of ecology in terms of a home. You know, what does it mean to have a common home? What does it mean to have a home, uh, to care for a uh, a home what does that even mean hey philosophically speaking there are such a lot to think about there so uh, the call to action by pope francis in laudato C, and i think it's very important and opposite for us to do that at a, a you know a catholic tertiary institution and that that is exactly also i suppose where you know, the decolonizing elements might come in and so on if, if we build up that further. But then the the thinking of Martin Heidegger. And then thirdly, there is a an, another underlying threat, uh, not threat, um, thread that sort of uh, runs through what I'm thinking about, and that is process philosophy. So process philosophy is um, the philosophy that sort of was introduced in modern times by Alfred North Whitehead. Um, he wrote even, yeah, more or less um, a contemporary of uh, Martin Heidegger. He's a British uh, mathematician and physicist who later on only became a philosopher after he moved to the United States and taught at Harvard College. But um, I think there's a very strong underlying thread in my own thought of, of, of thinking that process philosophy is, is uh, exciting uh, in terms of uh, addressing a lot of the questions that we have today, and perhaps overcoming some of the philosophical conundrums that we find ourselves in. So, so that's more or less, you know, where I want to situate it. Um, uh, I think so between Alfred North Whitehead and Martin Heidegger. But um, what does it mean to dwell? What does it mean to dwell? And and what does that have to do with ecology or oecology? Okay, so that's basically by my way of introduction, um, and I must now start to gather speed. So a first movement uh, that I want to make is just to say that the current ecological crisis is a philosophical crisis. So um, I know if you want to be more rigorous, you must now say, you wanna, is there even an ecological crisis or is it not only an environmental crisis? Philosophers always must really take care to define their terms and their concepts. So I'm going to just say, OK, we, we it's sort of um, popular to speak of an ecological crisis and an environmental crisis at the, at the moment and to use them interchangeably. And so uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to accept as a point of departure that there is such an ecological crisis at the moment and i'm going to argue that it is a philosophical crisis philosophical uh, in the sense of a crisis of worldview not all philosophical um, systems are really worked out um, often uh, often philosophy works on the level of worldview it's pre-articulated it's just the common way that people sort of look at the world, the common values that are there and that are operational um, in the world. So, um, and perhaps to be more uh, to be more specific, I would I would have should have said, hey, the ecological crisis is a crisis of Western philosophical thought. 
Um, and that is why it's a crisis now for the world, because of this uh, imperialism of Western philosophy and the hegemony of Western philosophy. But um, And the way that this kind of Western worldview somehow uh, worked. Okay, in explaining this, right, um, I, 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 I could just point you to a number of um, historical uh, explanations that have been made. You know, there, are, there have been many ways that people try to explain the, uh, the uh, onset of this current ecological crisis in terms of philosophical thinking. Uh, you can talk about the subject-object split that happened um, at the beginning of modernity. Uh, you know, where the, where the thinking subject came to be seen as opposed or over against um, ob objects over out there. Um, and, and then how do you sort of reconcile them? Um, another very famous um, genealogy of this current crisis has been given by Carolyn Merchant in her 1980 book, The Death of Nature, with its, uh, in its subtitle, it really connects feminism and echo uh, you know ecological critique so it's like an eco feminism um in in carolyn merchant's work uh reason you know disembodied reason uh, was coded as male and nature then is coded as female and is somehow uh, the the patriarchy of of reason is dominating nature and so it's a very interesting kind of uh, uh you know uh, Approach that you see there. Uh, so that's another way of perhaps approaching it. Um, Charles Taylor and Hubert Dreyfus uh, re recently um, wrote a book in which they uh, make a case again for a return to realism. But the what they they see the problem as happening here at the beginning of modernity is what's called mediationalism. And it's always kind of how how the outside world is mediated into the inside world um, of of the mind, kind of representationalism and so forth. Um, Martin Heidegger, in his 1938 lecture, "The Age of the World Picture," uh, somehow traced the same ground and said, uh, you, you know, uh, right there as somehow at the beginning of modernity the world became represented as a picture and then the mind is over against this um, and and that was somehow the problem because we don't live inside the world any longer as a world of care and of uh, concern but you know it split and the world became a, a picture to be represented to us um, Alfred North Whitehead, and this is just, uh, I'm, I'm conflating a number of uh, just tracings of what happened, um, just to show you that that, that has happened. Um, but, and Alfred North Whitehead, um, in his uh, books, for instance, Science and the Modern World, Religion in the Making, Process and Reality, spoke about the bifurcation of nature and for various reasons i find this work this one to be kind of very um telling for me and i like the way that he's used it so i'm going to speak of this crisis that developed in in worldview in philosophy and that sort of is now an ecological crisis as the bifurcation of nature that happened so basically um what happened is that a nature and human mind or the human came to be separated from each other. Um, on the one hand, nature is seen as mechanistic, materialistic, and somehow dead matter is first and foremost. Um, you can think of, you know, those 17th century uh, philosophers and, you know, natural philosophers, Galileo, primarily also Descartes, but um, later on, also Isaac Newton. Um, so we, 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 we have to treat nature as a kind of a mechanism, as mechanical. And it's, it's primarily, it's dead. It only has ex extension and mass and velocity. Uh, velocity. Where, where values, morality, 
um, living thought and freedom reside is in, in the human mind. Um, and so, of course, the great question is how do mechanistic nature and free human mind now interact and, and what do they and so basically you have nature as governed by deterministic uh, laws and then you have culture human culture governed by freedom and morality um this guy got a very influential um articulation in the work of Immanuel kant as well but we can apart from uh galileo descartes newton we can think of Roger uh, Francis Bacon and uh, also very importantly John Locke there because John Locke came to be in a sense of the uh, very important exponent I think of uh, liberalism right and this is also the thing okay um, I must rush um, I think this bifurcated state of nature is a uh, a popular view of the world for 250 years or, or more up to the present and i think it's being taught to our children still at school you know this is the way the world works materialistic mechanistic nature mind somehow problematic you know a lot of philosophy is a is philosophy of mind you know what does mind and brain have to do with each other but also uh, associated with that is the individualistic or the punctual self the self as almost a pure center of just willpower. And that is that is what the self is. And the self exists to maximize uh, its own pleasure or happiness, minimize its own suffering. And so you have um, an, uh, actually the start of homo economicus and the utilitarian kind of view of the world which is really very very dominant um in in the western world um interesting that in that same time um so with adam smith and uh the physiocrats just just before him you have another word that comes from the same root of oikos and that is the word economy hey and economy is somehow much much stronger um than ecology in a way um and it it became i think economic rationality became the kind of primary rationality um, of, of the modern western world how can the free individual uh maximize his or her own happiness how can uh, suffering be minimized um, and we do that through kind of a utilitarian instrumental reason. And it's interesting that I think capitalism is part of that same kind of uh, sphere. Capitalism is a way of is a way of basically, um, as we know, increasing uh, wealth through uh, you know our free interventions through in instrumental intervention we we grow capital hey um and i think colonialism goes together with that the time escapes me to explain it better and it has been done very well but i think modern western thought capitalism and colonialism go together uh with uh one another and of course as so many people have pointed out this is also part of all of this part of the part of the inequalities part of of uh the somehow the sad state of the world that we find ourselves in the global south uh really uh being in a way dis disadvantaged in, in comparison with the global north which is the metropolis we also have the environmental crisis of today and that's why i wanted to say that the the, the environmental or the ecological crisis is a philosophical crisis all of that this up to so far is not new it has been um, shown by many many people so the point is our worldview must change and um, along with other scholars you know for instance someone like barbara muraka who is um the university of oregon uh, i think that the process philosophical approach of alfred north whitehead um, offers a a very uh, exciting way of thinking of conceiving a new kind of worldview um 
So Weintig was one of the few philosophers of the 20th century that really set out a systematic metaphysics. Um, Martin Heidegger and the phenomenologists after him were really scared about setting out big systematic themes or, or systems, but uh, Weintig did that still. And the East philosophy of organism uh, basically holds that uh, each and every entity uh, that we see in the world is an event. Uh, each and every entity is an actual occasion of becoming. And each and every entity that we say can, that exists is also its own drop of experience or its own subjectivity. Um, therefore, it's not, subjectivity is not only in the human. Hey, um, Each and every entity that exists is somehow its own a drop of experience and subjectivity and in its becoming itself and growing to be itself it achieves objectivity and becomes the data for uh, a new concrescence for a new drop of experience that happens afterwards so everything is in process but here the point is everything is also related in becoming myself as a subject i i draw into myself actually in principle the whole of the universe the whole of the universe and this goes for each and every subject in each and every entity that really exists is in principle connected related to the whole of the universe and they're therefore intimately related to each and everything else and um, i think this this philosophy and uh, the system is has got a lot of um promise you know for really thinking how ecology can be um you know what ecology as a philosophical approach can and should be um so the point here is just if you look at that second uh, bullet is the human is not separate from everything else but emerges out of nature draws all of nature into itself um and <laughs> i think what's in in interesting here is that process thought works with a realism uh it's 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 realistic uh you know after immanuel kant we were scared a lot of western philosophy is really scared to talk about what's really out there we can only talk about the phenomena we can only talk about how things appear to the mind but um with white dead he was really sort of no 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 we 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 don't have to only do that there is a kind of an analogy um, and we can extrapolate from human experience and make a system of realism to say, but this, this is really the way it is. And it, it has a lot of, pre, uh, of promise for, in that sense, working with science, natural science, um, evolutionary science, and so on and so forth. Also with, um, you know, the theories of relativity and quantum mechanics. I can't go into that as well. But the question now is and this is now the second part okay the second part will be shorter of this uh, introduction of mine is it enough just to sink our humanity back into nature as if we are simply part of nature um, as if we are simply part of uh, the process of becoming i mean we are right we are as humans we are part of this process of becoming and to frame it in theological terms we're, we're part of this uh, ever ever growing evolving creation of god right uh but is this all is there not a human difference uh you know what what is that so so this is now the second part of of the talk i i do think we must flip it over as well and say that the philosophical crisis is an ecological crisis as well it's not only that the ecological crisis is a philosophical crisis, but the philosophical crisis is an ecological crisis. And, um, okay, I'll, I'll try and explain it very briefly now. Um, so one could again ask, well, is there a philosophical crisis? The short answer is philosophy is always about crisis. Hey? Philosophers are always in a crisis uh, because crisis means decision. Crisis means thinking. Um, crisis means deciding so philosophy is really always in a, in a way of bringing us back to that really fundamental choices that we are making but in a less profound sense we could also say that um, you know philosophy is in a crisis um, contemporary philosophy uh, i think a, a, a very important one is the blinkers of hegemonic western philosophy as if this one 
system or worldview uh, um, of Western philosophies, this approach, say, let's call it liberal, liberal Western values, as if this is the value of the whole world and that the world world should have. I think that's definitely a crisis for us. But other ways, we could also speak of the dwindling influence of academic philosophy. Um, somehow the world seems to be thinking that we should, we, we, we can really dispense with thinking, let's just do technoscience, hey? Let's do engineering and the STEM subject. Um, and that is definitely a, an existential crisis for philosophy. Um, but intra-philosophically, there's also a crisis. I mean, analytic philosophy, I think, in my view, really has, has been stuck in the kind of a naturalism and mechanistic materialism. So analytic philosophy sold out to natural science in that physicalist, naturalist kind of way. And in continental philosophy, yeah, um, that's that's more or less where, where I am coming from. But um, continental philosophy, you know, thinks of alienation, you know, the human condition post-World War II. Wow. And nihilism. Is there really some, is there really value in the world anymore? Is there really meaning in the world? And, um, and so you see a kind of a new realism developing now um, after after the heydays of phenomenology uh, and people tend to sort of maybe but people tend to see or say maybe we, we we should move over into a post human world um, everything really are are related and there's a kind of a realism there but but the human this in a way the human is just a machine you know or the human is also just a machine somehow it's just part of certain processes and that is uh, and of course i'm really over over uh, generalizing and over simplifying here but that's somehow where philosophy is also and it's gaining ascendance but i think we must be careful to speak of post-humanism I, I i think um it's it's not it's 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 not the way we should go and sort of to try and dissolve the human just into processes or complexity theory or chaos theory or anything like that um i don't think we should evacuate the human subjectivity in favor of a democracy of objects that was a book by um, a philosopher called levi bryant where everything is just uh, on the same level um some other uh, philosophers sort of perhaps in in some view still on the lunatic fringe want to move to a post-human future via transhumanism so the human must merge with technology technology into a place where perhaps human subjectivity is not really a big problem anymore we're all sort of part of a, a hive mind that the internet is and so your own individuality is, is a way I think that those are projects to move past the liberal uh, subject, which I think is good, but I don't think it should be in that way. Uh, my point is, we, while humans are part of nature, um, there is a human difference, hey? And how, how do we live with this? How do we, how do we, how to be, this difference without bifurcating nature again without now making those same mistakes like treating nature as a standing reserve treating nature as mere objects for plunder for capital accrual how do we how do we live this human difference without subjecting nature again to yeah to objectification and i think this is where philosophy should be ecology in the sense of oecology so philosophy um, must learn to dwell right the real dwelling plight lies in this that mortals ever search anew for the nature of dwelling that they must ever learn to dwell again so we we as humans we are the beings for which our dwelling place is a question for us how to dwell how to live in a home 
is always a question. You know, for, this is a paraphrase, of course, of Heidegger, who says, for me, uh, for humans, for Dasein, our existence is always a question for us. But I, I think he, he probably would also say this, that for us as humans, our dwelling in, in the world is a question. For um, other animals and other beings, perhaps less. Hey, um, and, and there's a gradation between existing entities like a fox, um, a, a cricket, an, an ant, a tree. You know, you you could speak of dwelling. They some of them, like a beaver, builds a home. Hey, a builder builds a home in a river. But there's somehow an uh, element of instinct in there. But for the human, you know, how are we going to build? How are we going to dwell? How do we want to dwell in such a way that we are not destroying the earth, but letting, letting nature as an event be um, and letting the beauty of it sort of come out? This is the question. Now, um, and... And when I say this, when I say that philosophy should be oikology, I know that uh, there's, there's, there's bound to be opposition to this. Um, for instance, very uh, well-known philosopher uh, Gilles Deleuze and his uh, co-worker Felix Guattari proposed that uh, thought should always be nomadic. Um, they suggested or proposed nomadology as the correct way for philosophy forward in other words philosophy must never rest philosophy human thought must always be restless always start up again never settle down um and there is of course something there hey we know what happened when when thought settles down you get onto theology you get master signifiers that that just abuse power um and that's, that is, of course, not what we should do. In that sense, we, we must. There must be an element of destruction or deconstruction again. But, but what would it mean, though? You cannot always be only negative. Postmodernity cannot always be negative. There is a form of a positive or a constructive postmodernity that we want to look at. And what would that be to, to, to conceive of this as oikology? And how do, how do we dwell? Um, in Heidegger's words, um, how do we dwell on the earth, under the sky, before the gods? This is his famous notion of the fourfold. As mortals, we dwell on the earth, under the sky, before the gods. How do we do that? How do we live in such a way as to let nature be? And this is, this is the mystical kind of term, Gelassenheit, that Heidegger borrowed from Meister Eckhart. And that 14th century uh, mystic. So, how do we live in this space where we are part of nature, part of the ecology, um, in the in the white Hadian sense, and also somehow also different from nature because there is a human difference where we think. Hey, we are thinking. How do we? And maybe that is where notions like care and intensity and so on come. So. I'm moving to the end now. Um, so practically, I think that the realism of process thought can fruitfully be combined with the human search for dwelling as invoked in the thought of the later Heidegger. So I think I think there's a kind of a very interesting space to be opened up between Whiteheadian kind of process thought and Heideggerian um, uh, human difference you know thought uh, thinking and philosophy and i think um, one can also um if you want to now apply this further and after you've developed this position you can uh, bring it into a very interesting conversation with Deleuze and Guattari's for instance nomadology and so on so um, i think the future must be realism but uh, so uh, under the main thrust of, uh, of our philosophy must be realistic. But maybe Whitehead was not so attuned as someone like Heidegger, for instance, to the human difference.
Um, again, practically, and this is my final slide, what I think we should work for is a kind of a post-liberal world. Uh, what would this post-liberal world look like? Uh, I don't know if uh, my colleague Rafael de Cat is here. I would love to hear what he says about the suggestion of a post-liberal world. Um, I do, do not think that the post-liberal world we should um, work towards should be um, a post-liberal world on the right, um, as for instance, what we find with, with you know, uh, this fascism or, uh, that uh, that's spreading over North America and parts of Europe at the moment. It should be a post-liberalism on the left. Uh, and what would that be? I think uh, what our world should work forward is a degrowth world, um, somehow a new worldview that that isn't premised on um, endless growth and, and, and accumulation and changing everything that's a resource into capital um, and the concomitant kind of um, um, increase in equality all over the world. And I think what the world that we should work towards um, with this philosophy is a multipolar world. Um, of course, if it's an ecological world, then and it is not only as if it's a monarchy and there's just one game in town, um, uh, uh, an empire. And I don't think we should kid ourselves that we definitely live in an imperial world still at the moment. But we must move towards a multipolar world, um, a world where there's an ecology of cultures. Um, and I think, you know, uh, here in South Africa and in the global south, we are well positioned to sort of embrace all of these aspects as well um, to try and, and work them out. But what, I've, what I'm is interested in is firstly now, first almost like the systematic elements, you know, what, uh, and, and methodologically, how do we approach this? And what I've tried to suggest to you is uh, a way perhaps of thinking philosophy and ecology close together um, by coining this word oikology. Okay, let me stop there. And um, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. M maybe we have five minutes, hey, Justin? Um, yeah, I could we have a little bit more than that. We have about 10, um, but um, I wouldn't mind going over if the conversation is okay. Don't worry about it too badly. Um, does anybody want to join and um, start off? Well, I'm waiting for a hand to pop up. Uh, I just, one of the things I really enjoyed about your paper was that it reminded me why I absolutely hate thought experiments. <laughs> because Why do you absolutely hate thought experiments, like the trolley problem and everything else like that? Because it's so devoid from the real world. It's like, uh, you know, like, what type of what type of ethics are you trying to actually keep in the so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Yeah, but does uh, anyone else have a comment or a question? Or... I see a number of people have joined since, eh? It's, it's a yeah. nice turnout. Thanks, everyone. And Tuli, would you like to just go ahead and turn off your mic and just start speaking? Th th <clears throat> Thank you, Doc, for the presentation. I just want to find out two things. I didn't catch up how to define your degrowth of the world. I hope I'm capturing this last slide. It has got, uh, if you can unpack that a bit for me, that's one. But then two, uh, I'm listening the thought where you are starting in 800. And this uh, split into two, like this, uh, the symbolism of the road that it is splitting into two kinds of things. Then I see you are putting capitalism there, you are putting uh, other things, some socialism, it can't be anything there. I, I want to find out, because to me it becomes interesting, I'm contextualizing this. Remember in 1800, that's the very time where Europe largely gathered in Berlin and in terms of finding ecology for themselves, opted then to colonize Africa. That's how I would anchor and I would say, I, I, I appreciate uh, this kind of analysis, the way it, these things somehow begins.
but we have now moved up to where we are but also human being now your last question to say what uh perhaps must we must we Im- immense ourselves into this crisis of thinking or what must happen let me pause here for now okay thank you very much uh, let me just find out is it uh is it benjamin that's talking there uh, yeah yes yes okay ben thanks good to see you as well um no so okay the the question of degrowth is interesting right um it's somehow um i need to think into it more it's a it's a word that's come up there are kind of couple of books that's being published um they're on my reading list but i i do think um how practically we can work with degrowth uh the economists must also tell us but obviously we cannot it's not ecological it's not kind of echo in a sense of being um, one household of the world it's if one party keeps on growing all the time there's just a finite we live in a finite universe so we can't keep on growing hey so there is there's something there uh, that we need to look at now in terms of what happened in europe in the in the 17th 18th centuries is really exactly that um, in, in my understanding that uh, capitalism um, modernity and colonialism sort of are working hand in hand the whole w- way of seeing nature as a resource hey for a certain kind of a subject it translates into a form of capitalism and then it's very very easy to see the the rest of the world as resources for the for the western world uh, and so it also translates into colonialism and so those three horses of the apocalypse run together and somehow not that i want to dismiss everything of modernity but of course those i think those um outflowings of of unbridled capitalism and colonialism is definitely to be rejected hey um, and if we understand the, the philosophical development then we perhaps if we can tell a certain story then we can also uh, respond to that story by telling a different kind of story and isn't that essentially what philosophy always does hey Does uh, anyone else have a Leanne? Uh, go right ahead. Leanne, go ahead. Ah, yes. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening. Um, Quite all right. I, um, I, I really enjoyed what you said about the multipolar ecology. And when you were describing that, I could really see how um, you're talking about ecology being a philosophy, sort of like a a kind of a, a world view that made a lot of sense to me mm-hmm. and i like the idea um and i just wanted to sort of uh, comment that uh, i've i've just finished an assignment on theological ex- aesthetics which sort of focused all on beauty and it it felt to me like when you were talking about that kind of multipolar ecology um that a vision of the beauty of that is um is very inspiring because Mm-hmm. you know one is drawn towards beauty and and if you've got a picture of like in a, an ecology that doesn't have like one one pole or two poles but is multipolar mm-hmm. according to literally the way nature works that that would be mm-hmm. a very healthy and a very inspirational philosophy yeah. yes thank you lian uh, i 100% agree with you uh, you know uh, there's a, a, a echo philosopher ecofeminist philosopher by the name of Val Plumwood mm-hmm. who uh, in a, in her book speaks of monolingual kind of philosophy or uh, um monological kind of philosophy where everything is coming from one side and it's typically also from a modernist kind of approach uh, that you know you have the speaking subject um imposing their ideas on the rest of the world um 
and instead of monological um, we we need of course dialogical and or plurivocal but you see it all over um, i mean isn't isn't part of the uh problem what what we have and i don't know of course it's it's very complicated but in agriculture in industrial agriculture at the moment you have these mono farming where yes. where, yes. where you have huge acres of of one kind of crop and then it's associated with a loss of biodiversity for instance and so on so definitely where you have the the plurivocal kind of world and i do think that it, it could be associated with beauty another kind of project that i'm also busy with at the back of my mind has to do with the notion of intensity and how does freedom and intensity go on and intensity could be perhaps associated with beauty. So uh, I, I definitely am, uh, I think that multipolar ecology or a multipolar world it would be a more beautiful world in, in my view. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sounds like me, sounds like to me you're sneaking in a little bit of Bruno Latour there too. <laughs> sure, because uh, I think Bruno Latour um, is, is definitely in many respects, following Whitehead, hey, he was influenced by Whitehead with his notion of of uh, nature and culture split and so on. Yeah, yeah. Just to catch everybody, uh, Bruno Latour has a book, uh, has several books. But one of them is called "We've Never Been Modern," and uh, one of the things he critiques is this nature and culture divide, and also how we have a subject and object divide, and how we never actually really follow these rules unless they're to our advantage. But uh, um, it's a it's been a great conversation um if you have more questions then please send them um to uh, uh dr kruger um of course you have his email uh j.kruger at san augustine.ac.za but uh yaku real quickly um thinking of the classes coming up this year and next year or anything of that nature um uh, do you have any class where you're going to be focusing specifically on what you're talking about here or maybe you can uh, entice some people to join you um, in a class or something well, the, the info uh, module that I'm presenting um, in the fourth quarter has to do with um, uh, with methodology in philosophy. And so, uh, and I will be sort of engaging a lot with Deleuze's thought, but perhaps I can then in that module really sneak in some elements of what I've been trying to work out here as well in this, in that fourth um, info uh, module uh, in, in the, in the, that starts in October, Justin okay great well uh there you have it guys um you can um you can get a little sneak preview of it in on the fourth module or fourth uh the fourth quarter module also via email i'm sure that uh, uh dr kruger be happy to chat um and um hopefully in future events that we have similar to this um, so thank you so much um i wish we can give you a round of applause but <laughs> well done <laughs> thank you very much and looking forward to the others now the main show <laughs> yeah uh at Asheville, uh, are you uh, still on bloat shedding? Uh, yeah, everything's fine. I can go ahead, or if you want me to try and wait, if you uh, prefer Anastasia to go first. Um, well, let, yeah. me ask, let me ask Anastasia, uh, what's her status? No, I, I don't mind um, waiting because, I mean, you on load shedding. Okay, um, so, so you're fine. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Well, in that case, uh, um, Ashwell, uh, go ahead and um, um, you can turn on your screen and st start presenting. I'll introduce you. Thanks, Anastasia. So a um, brief bio of Ashwell Barrett Glasson, uh, a registrar at the Southern um, African Wildlife College in the center of Kruger National Park, a trainer of wildlife law enforcement officials, a ranger, a field guide, and supports state work on addressing and corruption and conservation. Uh, the specter of poaching and criminalization of rural communities, advises the military of training of warrant officers and rangers, care for students and members of, the, uh, of his community, and uh, I'm going to really, really screw up this Dutch, Velverdiend, and Britain. <laughs> An emerging author in the militarization of conservation technology and combating wildlife and crime, uh, following in the guns of the rhino rival syndicates. Uh, he has a, a couple of publications out as well. If you're interested, we will send you those later. 
but I don't want to take any more time for you. So uh, please go right ahead. Great. Uh, can everybody hear me? Everything good? Um, the information looks great. I can see you. Yes, thank Thanks, you. Um, so everybody, <laughs> it's great that Yaku spoke before because he's touched on several items. Uh, and, and everybody, please note, uh, I'm coming in from a very applied kind of background, but there's several threads that Yaku has mentioned um, uh, that touch on my um, honours uh, MP studies research paper. So I'm very lucky uh, and fortunate uh, to have uh, Peggy O'Hagan as my supervisor. Um, I'll admit up front, I've been a year and a bit late. Those other publications and COVID kind of complicated things a bit. Um, so just for all the other students listening, um, stay committed. Um, that's a picture of me uh, doing what I love doing on the side, which is bird watching. And I thought I'd just kind of use the power of imagery to uh, give you some insights into the background of um, what I'm doing and what the study is about. So uh, essentially, the research topic is um, wildlife law enforcement perspectives in the central Kruger. And to really get uh, uh, wildlife law enforcement office to, officers understanding of what motivates wildlife crime. Um, and then obviously solutions. Now, some may think I've kind of got a very specific approach and I'm really glad uh, Yaku mentioned realism uh, and some of the philosophical challenges that we, we have when we enter into these studies. Um, obviously, I'm involved in it uh, myself, which also presents um, an advantage and disadvantage, which I'll get to uh, um, a little bit later. But this kind of gives you a sense of um, some of the background, which I'm going to go into. And then just to uh, unpack what I've learned with you and allow uh, for some de uh, debate and, and questions. Um, and I'll make this available as well. So um, this is where I live. <laughs> I live in a beautiful place. Um, I'm blessed. I'm very fortunate. Uh, um, you can see the view. I know Prof Sacco enjoys going to the park, uh, as many uh, others at uh, the college. Uh, going to the toilet at night can be challenging. Got to watch where you're walking. Um, uh, my traffic uh, can be uh, entertaining, as sometimes a bit scary. Uh, and exercising can be challenging, a motivator or demotivator um, as well. Um, uh, my students, and I say mine, I say that proudly, um, are drawn from all over the subcontinent as far as the Central African Republic. Um, and this is them in happy, uh, happy mode as civilians. This is them learning as law enforcement officers. Um, and here you can see how things shift and change. Uh, this is them all graduating in uniform. Um, uh, about to be um, uh, qualified uh, and eventually heading back to Zambia, Malawi, um, etc. Um, obviously, uh, hence you can see the militarized approach, which uh, is obviously in itself a challenge. Um, and from somebody like myself, admitting that it's a challenge to uh, only focus on militarized solutions um, is something that we have to be very aware of. And I think Yaku touched on um, the kind of the realistic approach and philosophy. What we're dealing with, and, and there might be some people, um, uh, I know this is an awful image. This is a poached rhino that uh, we located. Um, you can see the front half of its head is missing um, and the horn is removed. I'm not going to lurk on these images. And those students that I showed you earlier, those wildlife law enforcement officers, are trained to prevent this from happening. Um, there's forensically the, the bullet that um, uh, did its bit. Um, and here's what we call a rhino cemetery. And just hearing Yaku earlier just made me think of, <laughs> we've created cemeteries for wildlife that we value, um, that uh, we've lost. And philosophically and psychologically, there's quite a strong debate 
uh, around this, but I, I wanted to show you the imagery uh, so you could see some of this. We also encounter, and because I'm a peace study student, we also occasionally find this, the legacy of wars, um, um, the legacy of conflict in Africa um, that uh, comes through. And I, I've, I've done a bit of work on following the guns, as they call it. Um, and yeah, very, very tough. Um, I live inside a fortress. You can see that's my part of my world, a uh, 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 fenced in a conservation area with all the fancy cameras. And by the way, that long piece with that camera sticking on it, every vehicle that goes past, uh, it looks at the license plates and can ID uh, the car and um, the license uh, plate of the car and ultimately the owner of that vehicle. And this is a world we've entered into, uh, a world of um, surveillance. Uh, some will call it the Big Brother Syndrome. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite frightening. Um, in this picture on the left, it's not necessarily that obvious as a protected area, and on the right as a community area. Um, my research is also touching on the fact that we live in border realms. We live in boundaries. Uh, some uh, physically created um, legacies of uh, other times. Um, and uh, here's an example, that tar road. And this is the road into the community, Valfordient, where I have, I have a lot of friends and staff who work there. Um, um, and compare uh, one of my staff members' house to mine, and I know I'm being very hard hitting. Uh, I have running water. Uh, some of you may know what a Jojo tank is. You can see he gets his water from uh, from the, that Jojo tank on the right. Um, he has an entrepreneur um, trying to build a business uh, in the local community, and he has his children. <laughs> uh, he has another man whose entire life is in that picture um, in terms of economic value. Um, here are dogs that will never be pets. Uh, these will be dogs that will be used to hunt poachers, uh, literally other human beings. And I'm being provocative on purpose. Uh, this is my one uh, that I eventually had to pass on that uh, I kind of raised to the puppy phase. And uh, how we value this beautiful animal has changed for me and many people. This dog is now a tool in combating wildlife crime. Uh, for those of you who go through the airport in Johannesburg, you probably noticed that there are more dogs around uh, with handlers. Um, so in terms of the background, um, I really wanted to tackle a difficult subject. Um, uh, I'm in both worlds. Um, uh, I spend a lot of time supporting community, um, su supporting my colleagues uh, in rural communities that are, as we know, the current state of things in South Africa and generally in the global south, things are not good. Um, I'm not going to go into the background of the why. But, uh, Yaku, you've touched on some of the, the issues. When we have conversations, we, re we realize that they are commons ecologically, and I'm going to use it from the hard uh, biological science and socially speaking, uh, how we value things, uh, um, things that we need to survive at the bottom end of Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, then the pervasive legacy of colonialism, apartheid, um, imperialism um, is very much alive. Make no mistake, all those glossy magazine covers or websites you see of wonderful lodges and uh, safari experiences come at a price. Uh, and that price is still being paid now. Um, uh, the background of the research has shown that the global north is still very dominant and not just in other debates. It's very dominant in conservation and in NGOs. We find ourselves um, um, often uh, out uh, resourced. They can pay for the lawyers, they can pay for the, the advocates, they can pay for the services uh, that we can't when we try and contest 
um, their perspective. Um, <laughs> Yaku, you can see um, realism uh, and the philosophy of realism. I, I'm not um, a practice philosopher by any means, but it seems like realism is resurgent in my field um, and the work that we do. And then uh, one of the big battles that is happening in wildlife and conservation right now um, is that most people argue that wildlife will be only valued if it is an economic commodity, something that can be traded. Uh, those images of the, the rhino earlier um, uh, talk to the horn, and the horn has value. Um, and economics uh, and realism seem to be dominating um, our field right now. And it does start asking the question, and obviously it's not an honors level attempt either, but where do other value systems feature? Uh, how do we eventually tackle um, uh, balancing this out? And I think it was Leanne and Yaku were speaking about um, a multipolar world. I'm not necessarily saying that in the political philosophy sense, but there is a, a, a need. Um, my work and my paper um, has definitely picked up on what I call the nexus effect. We, we, we seem to be seeing uh, not just um, binary issues, but we're seeing uh, things that are nexuses. Uh, and those nexus events, in my case, um, development doesn't happen uh, in conservation or in communities unless there's security, unless we securitize um, our conservation environment, which means essentially fortress conservation, which kind of goes back to the original uh, colonial um, uh, of 1884. I think Benjamin mentioned it. Um, that legacy is still very much uh, in place um, as well. So uh, the, the nexus uh, insights into my paper have been very useful because of the connections between some of the causal drivers. And one has to, in our uh, complex learning environment, uh, look beyond just the binary, uh, if that makes sense, is to look at different factors. Otherwise, one may exclude um, things that are very valuable. Um, and you can obviously see uh, they're worthy of study in themselves. Um, I've spoken about the security conservation development nexus. I originally started out, um, and you know, I have to be quite careful in terms of bias and ethics uh, because of my background, but um, I started out just purely with militarism, but then realized um, uh, that through the literature review, it actually was about securitization of um, society as a whole, and that we don't we are not able to support development in our rural communities and some urban communities that are in biodiverse biodiversity rich regions um, and i'll use a very easy example that's got nothing to do where i'm based in the central kruger and the adjoining communities table mountain national park for example um, if you pick up on all the recent discussions around it um, it's all about safety. It's all about securitizing uh, um, Table Mountain National Park. And possibly, now you might hear some of my bias in this conversation, uh, the issues around um, uh, access. Who's got access? Um, and this is a really key thing because we know in South Africa particularly, uh, issues of land reform, um, the the exit of apartheid is not really exited, and, and particularly in conservation. Um, uh, and the work, the literature review um, is certainly showing that. Um, having said all of that, it's also important, uh, like just, I um, mean, you know, because I've been a late student um, in terms of my work, is to seek clarity and try and simplify it for yourself as much as possible without losing the value in the process. Um, I found myself having to go back many times and reread and reread and reread. Um, and when I forgot to take notes, then, oh boy, I lost what I thought about um, 
two or three days ago, what I read. Um, so this has kind of raised the challenges a bit. I don't want to uh, over talk about my actual study, but rather share value with the rest of you as much as I can. Um, for me, for Ashwell, reading every day and engaging every day, at least 30 minutes, um, uh, really helps um, with studying and working in a academic or research kind of context, particularly, I think the bulk of us are all full time employees got families, we've got all sorts of things. But if you can just find that those magic 30 minutes uh, can make a uh, immense difference to you. Then the other challenge which Peggy and I have spoken about at length a lot is is uh, bias. And uh, I mentioned it earlier bias um, we, you, we really have to be careful. I have an advantage because I'm inside the system, but that can be a disadvantage too. Um, you have to remain committed to the research process and not fall into confirmation bias. Um, and uh, uh, when one is sometimes inside the system, you tend to think, okay, I know the answers already. My research paper is just going to confirm what I already know and I'm going to get a great mark. No. You have to stretch yourself um, as well. And then in my case, I've, I've been blessed uh, to be able to publish outside of my studies. <laughs> Keeping the word count down and going off topic has probably been one of my greatest challenges. And I can only encourage um, other students tonight to really um, bounce off your supervisors. Um, uh, and maybe the supervisor is not going to like hearing this, but rather uh, engage with them more regularly um, on what you're writing and help you to kind of frame it and keep it simpler but still rich and valuable uh, for you um, in my case uh, the data sampling the literature review and uh, engagement has just shown that i have to really use maximum variation sampling and um, there's such divergent perspectives um, and contested perspectives. And in discussion with Peggy and with Peggy's support, I realized there, there is the temptation to try and find the middle way where you almost synergize uh, uh, and try and um, make it easier for yourself. No, don't. Um, bring in those, those contesting perspectives, um, particularly in an empirical work. I, I've not worked in uh in any other form of research so this has just been my experience um otherwise things start sounding and looking the same um one of the key thing, things uh, as a recent author i've been lucky to publish in one book uh and several articles but um uh, i call it extreme checking i've been subject to uh, a lot of peer review processes uh, with the Institute of Security Studies in Pretoria and uh, the European Union uh, anti-crime initiative. Um, and wow, it's interesting to see who uses your work without, without actually recognizing you, um, recognizing your contribution. And I just wanted to say to all of you, because you're all academics, um, like me, emerging academics, um, uh, cite respect and you'll get the respect back as well uh, i'm not saying people are plagiarizing but your work is unique and um, just keep focusing on that uh, and keep driving it um, uh, that kind of follows on to my next point um, i've encountered one or two of my friends <laughs> who've quoted me uh, with, and obviously when you turn it in or those kind of things it's very easy the days of um uh kind of plagiarizing and copying and all of that stuff and i've taken them to task uh as well now one of the things i've also learned and i've made this mistake myself is that if you are working on something and it's late at night sometimes it's easier ah oh, that the way this thing that i found online it's just sounds brilliant <laughs> so you copy and paste uh, and put it in um try avoid it as much as you can so you don't have to worry about those kind of things later um whoops and 
I think I rushed through it uh, with the half an hour. Um, Justin, I think, sorry, I realize I got to the end. Peggy, is there anything yeah. else you need to add? Uh, maybe we can have time for a Q&A if you'd like. Uh, if Peggy wants to jump in, she's more than welcome to as well. Uh, no, well, I, and thank you, um, Ashel. That was lovely. Uh, really nice. I really enjoyed the, the beginning part. I know the, the other parts. And I thank you for sharing your, your journey. Um, and I hope that other students will maybe ask some questions on part of your research journey. Um, I, so I just have a word of warning. You may not change your theoretical framework to Yakos now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I won't. I, 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 With I won't all due respect, to I saw all the things jumping in there and um, and the connections and the links, which is lovely. Um, but just don't get carried away with it now. And I think that's you know part of it is to be sure that we, you know, we, we stick and keep it narrow. Um, maybe that's something we can also talk about. <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, don't switch over to midstream. Uh, but real quickly, since you were talking about citations and since you uh, you have a book out or you have some publications out, um, everybody can see my screen here, right? It's very important for you to go to Google Scholar. And um, then um, Google Scholar, first off, whenever you're searching um, any type of author, like let's say we're searching for you, we can see uh, not just what you've written, but we can also see who cited you and that might lead to further research down the road and everything else also and this might be very helpful for, um, for a lot of you is to create your own profile so um, i created a profile and um, um, i created it on my actually on this account so if i go to google scholar here i can see who cited me um, and why, uh, where, where my work is going and where it's taken and so forth. And um, creating a profile here is much easier than even creating like a, a profile on, uh, uh, on uh, Facebook or something. So here are all my citations. There's my H index, which needs to be a little bit higher. You can see like this article has been cited 24 times. You can click on it. You can figure out who's been citing you. Um, so this is one of the reasons why citations are important, is that it keeps the conversation going and it helps you be a part of it, but also allows other people to, uh, uh, to comment on your work and everything else. So um, yeah, uh, Google Scholar, first off, very helpful whenever it comes to trying to find articles, but also uh, very helpful in your own projects. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, but uh, I will save all that conversation for a little bit later. Uh, let me stop. Presenting, I think I saw a hand up. If you want to know about Google, more more about Google Scholar than just email me, but I just thought it might be interesting. And Tuli, I thought I saw your hand up there. Nalantando. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ashwin, I just want to find out in your your, your paper. Uh, I, I I listened to it, but I just want to quickly move to say, suppose I read your paper at the end, what kind of knowledge must I, or information must I draw? That's one. Then two, I know it might be a side issue, but the issue is I looked at you, 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 are, you are what you call, you are dwelling, and you are dwelling presents both the situation, the real situation of South Africa, where you find your house is better than that of your employ employees. But I want to find out what kind of relationship do you have, because I believe one of the things what we why we do research or we try to find study more is to resolve some of the problems that have been created historically. So I just want to hear your comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. That's a, a great uh, set of questions. Yes, I do live in a better place, uh, um, uh, a better constructed place. And that's why I wanted to show it up front. 
is to show the disparity between me as a researcher and some of the people I engage with. Uh, the challenge of the honors paper uh, to answer the question with uh, what information, uh, it's more about a call to action. Um, and that call to action is to do more for those communities. Uh, and resolving, uh, and now <laughs> I'm, I'm treading into a domain where I was kind of cautioning everybody uh, that you've got to let the research process unfold. But what I personally would like to see is that more is done to build bridges between uh, the communities and to uh, to to break those borders. Uh, I, I put a picture there showing one side of the road that's protected and well resourced and the other side is not. So it's also a call to action. Although I sometimes wear a uniform and I look like the police, I don't necessarily agree with, well, I don't. I don't agree with the militarization of conservation. So now you've heard my real opi opinion, Benjamin. But what I'm trying to do is to get my fellow law enforcement officers at some point, and I'm hoping this will be a post-grad opportunity, um, maybe even an action research uh, kind of approach, is to see how the research can actually impact in the short term um, as well. So uh, the information in the conclusion is I'm hoping to say that um, law enforcement officers must think beyond the, the reality. And I, and I think uh, just to also uh, keep Peggy happy, uh, I loved what I heard from Yaku because a lot of law enforcement people uh, think that uh, communities and poachers are poaching rhino horn only because of the money. There are other questions and we need that knowledge in order to address the fundamental issues that underlie that. That's not the problem. Uh, that's the symptom. Uh, and uh, sorry, I can talk about this. I'm very passionate about it um, <laughs> for ages. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, Benjamin. Is that, does that help you? Yes, I think uh, environmentally wise, I think uh, I get the sense where you are coming from. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Benjamin, for the two yeah. questions. Uh, just to add um, uh, a few things real quickly. First off, um, it seems to me like Ashwell's project is um, well advanced, but also he has a, a background in his information that some of you guys may not. So keep in mind that the Honors Project is not necessarily uh, intended to be an academic contribution per se, not like a, not like you'd see for the infill mini dissertation, especially not for the DFIL, where you're supposed to make an academic contribution. So worry not if you're not at that level. Uh, but um, if you think about any academic paper, there's always what we call the upshot or the so what, you know, like, all right, you maybe read 30 pages on Heidegger. So what? What's the point? What's the upshot? And the paper in some way should have informed you or convinced you uh, to change your mind on something. So in a sense, um, all academic papers, all good ones that really change your mind or really change your, um, your perspective on the world or something like that is a call to action. Um, sometimes the papers um, um, unjustly, in my opinion, get called like activist papers or like, um, uh, you know, people are calling them, um, this research just purely activism and not really research qua research. Um, and there are some bad research papers out there, true, but the thing is, is that if you back it up with all the convincing information, then your analysis in your final section, it should change people's minds and it should have an action research approach as Ryako Kruger talked about it. So um, yeah, all good research should change you in some way. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, just Ashwell's, uh, it's, uh, it's home, especially if you've ever been to Kruger, which uh, um, I love and appreciate. Um, but uh, we can talk about methodology all day if you'd like me to. <laughs> uh, I, uh, that's one of my favorite things to, uh, to discuss. But we have one more, one more paper for the day. Um, and I suppose it's Anastasia, even though I want to call her Anastasia. Uh, but Anastasia de Vries, um, uh, the title of her presentation is Rethinking the History of Afrikaans as a Language of the Church. Um, from her bio, she says she teaches Afrikaans sociolinguistics. Afrikaans for the language practices, this is for journalism, document design, and editing, creative writing, and Dutch literature at the Department Afrikaans and Dutch Studies at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, the title of her doctoral, doctoral study is Afrikaans in the Catholic Church, 
from marginalization to the stigmatization towards inclusivity. Um, so, Anastasia, uh, you have the floor, please go right ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, I will quickly show my face and then I will turn it off. My um, supervisor is Yaku, and I think I give him gray hairs, um, but I am making progress. <laughs> okay, so um, my paper is Rethinking the History of Afrikaans as the Language of the Church. And first I had um, the title, uh, within post-structuralist uh, theory, damned if you do, damned if you don't, because I also had uh, some comment from the from a reviewer on an article that I wrote in which I gave an alternative history to um, the existing history of Afrikaans as a language of the church which um, disputes what is written and also undermines what is written. So I think I'm an activist, but I am a, I am gladly one. So I will first contextualize my paper in the sense that the last time I did a, 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 a presentation, I burst into tears because I was absent, silenced in the um, history of the Catholic Church as an Afrikaans speaking um, uh, Catholic. I wasn't there. I was there in the 20th century, but I wasn't really there. I think it applies to every other indigenous language um, besides, I think, Zulu, where the history is connected to Marian Hill. And also, in the Afrikaans um, linguistic history, every denomination in this country is aligned to um, developments in the uh, re uh, Dutch Reformed Church, which is situated in the 20th century. So though I focus on, on um, Afrikaans language, my... Um, research is neither a linguistic or a social linguistic um, study. I am more concerned with how knowledge about the role of the church in the development and the establishment of Afrikaans was or is constructed and um, the representation of the Catholic church in this Afrikaans history. So I work with a lot of questions, uh, of which I will name a few. What discourses about Afrikaans as the language of the church are naturalized, hegemonic, or dominant? How are dominant representations of these um, discourses produced and um, perhaps challenged? Um, whose interest interests do they serve and also whose interests are ignored what are these um how are counter hegemonic um views of about afrikaans in the relation to the church dealt with in public discourses or historiographies of afrikaans so um these questions then shift the focus to the relation between power and discourse, which in turn points to the problem of representation. So in order for me to interrogate how certain discourses have shaped and created knowledge that have gained the status and the currency of truth in inverted, inverted commas, which um, other, uh, alternative discourses are marginalized and subjugated. I mapped a theoretical trajectory for my research, which includes discourse theory inspired by Michel Foucault, Pierre Bourdieu, thank you, Yaku, and Jacques Derrida, alongside Marxism, and um, psychoanalysis, um, specifically Jacques Lacan. So in terms of Marxism, I looked at Antonio Gramsci 
uh, on hegemony and Louis Althusser on ideology. So now this allowed me to analyze existing literature across the intersection, intersections of my study, which is history, language, Afrikaans, and then religion, Christianity, because nobody ever, ever looks at oppression within um, Christianity. They only looked at um, oppression in terms of Islam and Christianity. And I did these analyses across two phases. One, I did a content analysis of a wide body of literature on the history of Afrikaans, specifically in relation to the church in general and the Catholic church in particular. But I also added to this literature, I added um, literature on the history of the Roman Catholic Church in South Africa with due attention to the place of Afrikaans and Afrikaans speaking Catholics in this history. This um, content analysis enabled me to establish meanings, themes, patterns in the representation of Afrikaans in the con context of church. Um, and in this way, I could systematically um, define and also um, uh, uh, um, interpret the discourses in terms of the representation of the history of Afrikaans as a language of the church or of, an, of, of an, a language of Christianity in South Africa. I accounted for how these discourses work in producing dominant knowledge to the exclusion of alternative views by tying the discourses I identified two theories in the study in a process of triangulation. Um, but for me, the beauty of this approach, this theoretical framework, lies not only in the space it creates to question how some discourses acquire and even maintain their authority and how some voices are silenced, but for me, it is about how it also offers sites where hegemonic practices and knowledge can be contested, challenged, and resisted. So in the next um, part of my presentation, I would like to first give a brief account of my findings with, of the, in, in terms of the content and the discourse analysis, and then also how I resisted the um, dominant knowledge. Now, for, for um, people not familiar with Afrikaans as a language of the church, Afrikaans was first officially accepted as a language of the church, of religion, Christian religion, in the Reformed churches in um, the 20th century, 1914 onwards. It coincides with the translation of the Bible. And um, so, so when I analyze the content of particularly um, the most recent history, uh, histories of Afrikaans, which claim to be inclusive or communal, I noted that they, they yes, they include other denominations, um, among whom the Catholic Church, but every contribution of, the, of, of all churches to the development of Afrikaans are aligned to the Dutch Reformed developments. So the impression is that Afrikaans was first a language of the church since the 20th century. Now that can't be true because existing um, research done by um, Father Stubbs in 1989 
proves that Afrikaans was used as a language of the church alongside Dutch in the 19th century, as early as 1854. On the other hand, there is um, research, existing research on Afrikaans as a language of the church in the Moravian church since the 18th century. But you know what they did with that? They, 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 they um, extracted from the existing uh, uh, research everything that has to do with the 20th century. And then they um, included that in the presentation of Afrikaans as a, 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 as a language of the church in the 20th century. The research on the Anglican church became a footnote in the most recent um, history of Afrikaans. And the Moravian church was placed outside of the Afrikaans history by not referring to it as Genatendal Afrikaans, but as Genatendal Dutch. So that was a mechanism of exclusion for me. Also, when one looks at the history of, of the church, of, of the Catholic church, the history says that um, our history is 200 years old in, in, in um, South Africa and that there was nothing before that. Now, ironically, within Dutch Reformed uh, circles, even if it's in passing, they do acknowledge how diverse, religiously uh, uh, diverse South Africa was since the beginning of the, of, since, since 1652. And that has implications for the history of Afrikaans, because if we presume that Afrikaans developed as a language since the late 16th century, it means that Christians of diverse backgrounds contributed to the development of Afrikaans. But nobody's going to rewrite that history because it doesn't um, coincide with the history presented in current um, historiographies. The other thing that, that, that I noted was um, in analyzing in, in the uh, content analysis was that, um, you know, when, they, when they, they say, oh, we are using um, as many of the existing research to write this inclusive history. But the indiscriminate way, the, the, the uncontested, uncontested way, how they use it, serves almost like what um, Russell Bortman called locking devices. The same sources over and over and over again, as if no other interpretation of the history could be possible. The same applies to the history of the Catholic Church. Recent um, histories in celebration of 200 years of Catholicism in, um, in, Africa, in, in South Africa, you see the same um, uh, sources being used. And um, it is as if you are reading in, 20, in 2018, the same history that was written in 1960. Now what happened can't be changed. You can't change history, but how you present the history, how you look at the history, that, that can be, be, be different. So the same uh, uh, um, problem that the Afrikaans history has is also the problem of the, the, Catholic, um, the Catholic history the same um, sources acting as locking devices. The other thing is, if one presumes that there were Catholics since 1652, where is that history? 
for me it is it is it is so it is it is almost strange that a history beginning in 1818 where there was no visible sign of a bishop or a priest in this country is so fully and com almost completely documented and the rest are like islands in 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 a stream of documents so where where is the history of those who embodied the catholic church um since 1652 yes they they do write about 1658 when they were catholics but between 1658 and 1818 what happened to the catholics and the history of of, of the church with its almost uh, exclusive focus on priests and bishops remind me of what henry newman said about the laity the church without uh, uh, uh without the laity would look funny now for me the history of the church without the um, laity looks funny and for uh, 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 um, i point out that the history of the church the catholic church in south africa suffers from clericalism and also what bourdieu calls misrecognition for example, yes, there were attempts to, um, to, to, to contextualize why, why, why there were no Catholics or why the Catholic Church was almost invisible. But the contextualization is wrong because they say, yes, there was this, this, this rule that the the, um, the 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 religion of the ruler is the religion of the nation, but that did not apply in the Netherlands because they tried it, and their history, their reviewed history shows the Reformation came to the Netherlands almost fifty years after the rest of Europe. And it didn't start with the reformed churches. It started with the Baptists. And um, so, so they tried to uh, 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 um, make the reformed church the state church. They didn't succeed. So it didn't apply in, in, in the Netherlands, but it created what we call crypto Catholics, people who are in secret are um, Catholics. And I think the same the same uh, process repeated itself at the Cape since 1652. Because yes, people were not banned, but they were oppressed. Because it was a law, it wasn't a law in the Netherlands, but under the East um, Indian Com Company, it was a law the dutch east indian company it was a law because it wasn't about religion and that's that is another part of the history that i point out in my study it was about economic opportunism if one looks at the at, at the history of catholicism in the netherlands it is no coincidence that the the, um, the 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 banning of priests and bishops they were literally bodily removed from the country coincided 1580 with the closing of the harbors uh, by spain the portuguese harbors by Spain, and that became the problem. Not, not the religion. After the religious wars, it wasn't the problem anymore. It was about Spain closing the harbors, 
um, and uh, cutting off trade between Portugal and um, and um, uh, the Netherlands. So um, for me, the, the 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 fact is that the the historians do not recognize how they misrecognize and with misrecognition i mean um not not being able to recognize but to recognize wrongly because yes that rule applied not South dutch rule but it did apply under British rule, because in Britain it was different, um, and that that impacted the history of the Catholic Church in South Africa, um, also under British rule. So, um, Yaku sent me uh, uh, um, when I when I spoke to him about the misrecognition, and uh, which relates to habitus, how how people were conditioned. This is how it was, and it can't be anything different. Um, he sent me uh, uh, an article by Boaventura de Souza on abyssal thinking. And it's the same thing, not recognizing, mis misrecognizing um, your um, conclusions about the history. So what... Are the alternatives? Yes, I again used post-structuralist theory and the development of new ways of looking at history um, and the influence of those uh, of post-structuralism and especially the history um, methods and approaches of Hayden White, in which he says you need to make connections between things and events that are seemingly not connected. And so when I rewrote the history, the alternative, I'm not rewriting the history, but I wrote the alternative, I could show that the history of Afrikaans as a language of the church goes back to the fourth century in the Netherlands when they were Christianized only in the fourth century and that um, the the things the myths that they believed for so many years are untrue um, there are other uh, uh, um, interpretations of that for example um, that the, the the Bible translated by the state influenced the development of, of, of um, Dutch it was proven lately by a sociolinguist to be false. But look at the, um, the Afrikaans history of uh, 20, 20, 2018. That fact that is repeated as a fact and how it contributed to the development of Afrikaans. So I, um, wrote a history of Afrikaans as a language in the Catholic Church, so from a Catholic perspective, which goes way back to the fourth century, because if everything that is Dutch is related to Afrikaans, then everything that is related to Dutch concerning the Catholic Church is also part of the history of Afrikaans as a language of the, of the Church. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Um, I see that you've got a very breadth of uh, um, interlocutors and um, histories to bring together into a narrative. I imagine it's very difficult. Uh, do we have any uh, questions uh, from anybody? Um, I know that it's getting a little late, but if you can stay for just five minutes longer, maybe ask any questions that might be there. Uh, Yaka, go right ahead. Yes. Yes, yes. Nice, thanks, Justin, Anastasia. Of course, I'm uh, partial, uh, but I'm so, uh, uh, so happy. Uh, so very excited. 
Because that you have um, presented is uh, a lot of the, sorry, my, 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 get my, there we go, the, the hand is dropped now. A lot of the history that you presented, Anastasia, is playing, you know, it's, it's playing out here in South Africa. Now towards the end, you did mention uh, the deep uh, roots back into Europe, but um, the misrecognition of Afrikaans in the Catholic Church uh, or the, and the misrepresentation, I mean, it happened perhaps in Africa, uh, in South African historiography, do you think that your is in some ways can be called a decolonizing pro project as well as still, you know, is it is it a project of decolonizing um, the uh, Yes, it is. Yes, it is in the sense that I am writing the 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 alternative, not from a white perspective, not from a white but from an Afrikaans black perspective, and that makes it different because if you look at the history of the Catholic Church, and I I would presume it, it could be different when looking uh, 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 from another language then um, it is a totally different story. Then we are not 200 years old. Then we are older. Then we, the, then we have more to celebrate. I mean, Australia included the history of the laity in their celebratory uh, history. Why didn't we do it? Because we can't keep on repeating the same story and then saying, yes, but the Catholic Church is not in the history of South Africa and it's not in the history of the church in South Africa. My question is, okay, so now what are you doing about it? So this is my small co contribution and Yaku and I have plans that this, this research will not become a footnote in somebody else's book. <laughs> <laughs> but that it will become a publication on its own. So thank you, Yaku. Thanks to you. Hi, um, uh, Leanne Hunt has her hand raised. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I found that really fascinating. And I, it's, um, it's really interesting to, to think that uh, there's, there's just no history, you know, before 200 years ago. Um, now, I, I was just wondering because I'm, I have an interest in family history and, um, you know, people publish diaries and all sorts of things yes. in their families and they, or family Bibles and things like that. Um, and I was just wondering if, if it would be possible to put out some kind of a, a mini article in a Catholic publication to say, does anybody have any, um, you know, personal oh. histories of... Oh. of um, priests and you know uh communities catholic communities from from early days yes yes oh that's a great idea thank you very much mm. i um i spent about nine months traveling the country asking literally from parish to parish wow. for 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 documents so i do have um you know um histories of dioceses and parishes and all that um but yes if i can find personal histories mm. that would be so great mm. because i'm just thinking you know the, the catholic radio station um w w would be a, a an amazing place to sort of put out that kind yeah, of request nice. as well just because it reaches such a wide audience you know, yes. people sort of, they say, oh, my great grandfather wrote a diary, but I don't know what to do with it because it's in a language half Dutch. I can't understand it, you know, um, but it would be fascinating if, if you could get hold of some of those. Yes. Oh, and Judith, you said you would be, um, you, you would want to read the research. Unfortunately, it is written in Afrikaans. I'm very grateful to St. Augustine. Uh, for having given me permission to um, write my paper in Afrikaans. Um, but um, Yaku and I have plans to translate parts of it. 
and publish it. And Yako, I think you're going to be you're going to be uh, uh, called an activist. Uh, you're going to be called an an activist um, together with me. Oh, Judith, is your say what's your surname? Burgess. Ah, then I know you. <laughs> yes, I know. I was at school with your mom, Anastasia. <laughs> yes, my mom was your teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. um, on the personal history front, that I know you already have a post at um, UWC, but it does sound like a good uh, um, grant writing project. I'm pretty sure you can get a grant for that if you wanted to do oral history uh, documentation. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind for like the next project. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, uh, it, we're a little bit over, and I've been told that a lot of people load shedding happens for them at eight o'clock. So uh, we're going to make this last call. If you have anything to say, um, go ahead and say it now. So any of the presenters. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, cut it. Um, we'll we'll end it here. Well. Okay, Anastasia, thank you so much for your presentation. Ashwell, thank yours you. was excellent as well. Uh, yes. Yaku, um, I appreciate you uh, um, giving us a future trajectory of the, the, the philosophy faculty, what you're working on, what interests you. Um, it was excellent, and um, I can't wait to have some fun um, and debates and discussions because uh, uh, um, our work intersects but uh, does not completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Looking okay. forward to that. Thank eh? you so Thanks much. That. Take okay. care, guys. Thank okay, you, everyone, for showing up. Stay warm if you have load shedding tonight, okay? Thank you. Bye. Oh, can I turn off the recording?